13 years, he comes home a man of 32. And they started telling me I couldn't talk to him. In a television studio in Washington and, uh, on August 28, 1963, a small group from Hollywood, California, joined to give their own personally held views of the civil rights gathering which took place on that day. Here, as citizens committed to the cause of civil rights, are James Baldwin, and yet I had to do something very difficult, Sidney. Harry Belafonte, he's intelligent and articulate, but he's Marlon Brando, turned up. And the problem I Charlton face, Heston, human sympathy, mm. but I had to be a relentless Joseph Mankiewicz, get his story, and to be sympathetically played yeah. and Sidney Poitier, to press him without I I being seen. mean to him. The moderator, David Schoenberg. Gentlemen, I think that it's about time to begin our discussion. We're here in the studio today with seven men who have two things in common. They are entertainers and artists, and they've all come to Washington. There's seven out of some 200,000 American citizens who came to the Capitol to march for freedom and for jobs. They came from many states of the Union and in many states of mind. They came with many different involvements. Some of them who came here to Washington were long-term fighters for civil rights. Some of them have joined only very recently, but perhaps just as intensely. Perhaps we can start with these men and ask each and every one of them to tell us very succinctly to begin the discussion what brought them to Washington and how long they've been on this road, this march for jobs and freedom. Let's begin with a very well-known American novelist, one of our best writers, James Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin, what brought you to the march on Washington? I could say um, the fact that I was born a Negro in this country, more concretely, I felt... Um, there was no way for me not to be involved with um, what impressed me as being the most significant, the most important, the most loaded um, demonstration to free Americans that has ever happened in this country. Well, we'll talk more about that later, but first let's quickly get from each and every one of you, Mr. Brando, have you been on this road for a long time? I don't know. There was a time when nobody was on the road, uh, really. Uh, there was a time when uh, Rosa Parks stood up in a bus in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and from that date, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott took place. And uh, somewhere in the 50s, 18 Negroes in a Georgia prison camp broke their leg with sledgehammers to bring attention to the uh, condition that they were in. And slowly, uh, bit by bit, I became involved in this issue. And uh, uh, I guess uh, my springboard was listening to Martin Luther King speak about the, uh, the woe and uh, distress uh, in California. Uh, Joe Mankovich, writer, producer, director. Well, I've, like all Americans, I've been involved in what I call human rights ever since I was born in this country. Uh, I think that what has happened to me recently is that I've become violently aware of the urgency of human rights in America now. Uh, the fact that this is an inalienable thing and something that must exist if America is to exist and if our image is to exist and if our moral fiber is to exist. And this urgency and my awareness of it brought me here. I felt this sense of urgency myself, Mr. Poitier, and I noticed today all day long in all of the speeches and all of the placards, I saw the word or heard the word now, now, now repeated with insistency. Was it for you a case of urgency and now or has this been something that you've been fighting for a long time? Well, the nature of my life over the last 36 years has been such that uh, an urgency, uh, the urgency that was evident today has been bubbling in me personally for most of these years, at least most of the years I came into adulthood. Uh, I became interested in the civil rights struggle out of a necessity to survive. And I think my interest <coughs> started uh, many years ago never as intensely, however, as it exists today. How about a personal participation, such as today's extraordinary participation? Is this a, a rare experience for you? No, it is not a rare experience for me. <clears throat> I found, ha having lived in New York and in other parts of uh, America uh, over the last 20 years, since I came from the Caribbean, I found it necessary for self-protection and for <clears throat> to perpetuate my survival that I involve myself in any 
uh, activity that would ease my burden momentarily. And what was the involvement of Mr. Charlton Heston? Two years ago, I picketed some restaurants in Oklahoma, but without uh, one exception, up until very recently, like most Americans, I am expressed my support of civil rights largely by talking about it at cocktail parties, I'm afraid. But again, like most many Americans this summer, uh, I could no longer pay only lip service to a cause that was so urgently right and in a time that is so urgently now. Mr. Belafonte, many of us have felt, I particularly as a reporter around the world, I've seen things happen in certain countries at a given moment where what the French call a prise de conscience takes place, a sudden awareness of the problem. Now, I know in your case this hasn't been sudden. You've been very active in the civil rights movement, have you not? Yes, I have. Could you tell us a bit about your own role in civil rights? Well, civil rights are something that uh, I inherited, or at least a struggle for civil rights. I got it from my mother and my father, and they got it from their mother and their fathers. And uh, to be in Washington today was, for me, an accumulation of a number of generations of black Americans who have been trying to appeal to the conscience of white supremacy and a superior force that has denied and disenfranchised the Negro for so long and that to be in Washington was for me today a, a beginning really, a kind of a climax to generations of hope and uh, having been deeply immersed in the civil rights struggle and having been at the beginning of so many important civil rights issues in this country and demonstrations it was indeed a, 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 a very powerful moment to see two th hundred thousand people, mostly black people, but uh, also white people, and to know that a nation such as America, and the reason that I struggle with it so hard and I grapple with it so hard is because I really believe in the potential of this country. And this country has not realized its potential, it has not even begun to scratch its surface in the humanities. And, uh, uh, because I do feel strongly about that potential and because of the kind of inheritance, uh, inheritance I've had, uh, it was necessary for me to be there today. Mr. Belafonte, you are, I think, one of the lieutenants of Martin Luther King, who is uh, one That's of the right. most respected leaders of the movement. We all heard Mr. King say today that this was perhaps the greatest day for freedom in modern American history. Uh, perhaps we could ask Mr. Brando to say, tell us what that means to him. Uh, do you think then, uh, if it's the greatest day for freedom, that this is the beginning of some tremendous change in our country? And if so, how do you see it developing? Well, this is a revolution, of course, that uh, is sweeping our country now. And it, uh, if it ends up properly, perhaps uh, Indians will be given some of their land back that they have uh, rightful claims on by treaty. Uh, Certainly uh, the benefit of all minorities, Jews, Filipinos, Chinese, uh, uh, Negroes, uh, Hindustani, Koreans, all people will benefit. Today was an unprecedented event in that uh, it is the only time in history, I believe, in America when two, over 200,000 people have gathered to say with one voice and with one uh, spirit, uh, uh, one cause. And uh, I think that it's easy to oversimplify this problem. The, the problem seems to me a subtler one, and it has to do with hatred. It's true that the Avambundu tribe, uh, which roamed from an area of, uh, I think, Tanganyika to uh, Angola, was responsible for the acquisition of 15 million of their fellow Negroes, uh, citizens, and sold them into slavery. Uh, Certainly the cruelties that have gone on in between the white races uh, will testify to this inherent uh, anger that all men feel. And uh, no matter where you look, whether it's uh, in Franco Spain or uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government or uh, in uh, some of the South American countries, the, uh, the, the distress that you see in Haiti today gives evidence of the fact that we are, are all, as human beings, filled with anguish and hatred and fear. And I think that that is what we are 
expressly addressing ourselves here uh, to today here in this movement. I think it's one step closer to trying to understand the human heart, to try to uh, understand what is it that has produced this? What excuse is it that we give ourselves to give the expression to burning children with cattle prods and uh, destroying people? You know, as I listen to you, something strikes me, and I'd like to throw this out for discussion or anybody who wants to answer it. You've mentioned a number of countries in which there have been oppressions and repressions and in which man has been hateful to his brother and uh, in which this anger expresses itself in a demonstration of one kind or the other. What strikes me is that almost, I think, all the countries you've mentioned are countries in the Western world, uh, countries where we know about repression and we, where we have an opportunity uh, to demonstrate against them, as we've had in Washington here today. Uh, this is not a, really a flag-waving question of mine, but I've been a foreign correspondent for a quarter of a century. All of you gentlemen have worked overseas. Um, it does occur to me that demonstrations of this kind could not easily be held elsewhere. And when we talk about oppression and repression, I haven't seen any march on Moscow or march on Peking. And with all the faults that we have and which we're trying to examine, wouldn't you agree it's fair that the hope of our country is that we, we can have demonstrations of this kind? Well, I, uh, I haven't remarked to Jim Baldwin on our way down this morning. I suddenly turned, I saw, I saw these fantastic preparations going on, and I found myself saying that this is wonderful, this is horrible, this is joyous, and this is depressing, that this is the only country in the Western world, almost, I think, in England, it could happen, probably, possibly in France. In the whole world. Though. Yes, That's in which this could happen, a meeting like this, but it's also the only country in which it is necessary. This is, this is the frustrating thing that surely we can, we can have a meeting like this today in this country, but at the same time, it is necessary in this country. You see, what, uh, the, what, what, you think it's, well, uh, what Joe, to me we the most important thing is that freedom, true freedom, is not given by governments. Of and freedom is taken by the people. And the excitement of today, in my mind, is the fact that one out of every thousand Americans was here in Washington and that the people of America are becoming aware that this freedom to their fellow human beings, and I call them human rights, are theirs to give. The Civil Rights Bill is not as important as the fact that the people have freedom to give, and I think now will begin to give it. Mr. Heston was about to come in on this. Uh, earlier you said uh, very modestly and with considerable humility that until recently, you'd reserved your civil rights position for cocktail parties, and that's lo lo no longer true. Would you uh, expand on that first? I'm afraid I have very little to expand in terms of direct action beyond my uh, participation in the most moving events of, uh, of today. But uh, I would, um, to some extent, uh, disagree, at least as I understood uh, Joe's and Marlin's point, uh, the prime thing I extracted from today's events was a, a quite hopeful and stirring feeling of, uh, uh, for the future, and also a, a restatement of the principles on which this country was founded. Uh, Dr. King said most eloquently that uh, now seems finally to be the time when the, the check which the Negro American has presented so often and had returned to him marked insufficient funds may at last be on the verge of being cashable and uh, in terms of, uh, of equality with his fellow Americans. But as an American, I am as stirred by the fact that this is true as I am by whatever capacity I have to empathize with my Negro fellow citizens. Uh, in their eloquent cry that it finally happened now. And I, uh, I cannot forget that, uh, as, as you suggested, this uh, is a country and a system of government that was, uh, however tardy we are in extending freedom to all its citizens, we conceived the idea of freedom for all citizens under the law. And among the many eloquent things that were said today, uh, 
James Baldwin has written as eloquently as, as anyone on, on this subject, but uh, most of the men who have written on civil rights and spoken on it trace back uh, what they speak about to the statements made by Lincoln and Jefferson. And uh, although the, the end is not yet, the, uh, as Harry suggested, this is perhaps a beginning. And the times ahead are just as, uh, as difficult as the times behind, although well, in a different way. Where do we go from this beginning? Um, the tremendous energy churned up here, of course, is a motivating force. But it's vague, it's diffuse, unless the plan of action cause, causes people to really correct in fact, and not only in oratory. Uh, will this tremendous outburst now uh, uh, lead to a course of action, Mr. Belafonte? That I will feel speed that up? Uh, the now that we speak of is not a now that describes uh, a success or fulfillment of the issues and the grievances that face the Negro people. The now is, is, is a statement that from here on in there's a point of no return, uh, that uh, there is success or there is utter failure. Uh, there is no middle of the line. There is no compromise on the issue. Uh, the now that is being spoken about is the fact that in a hundred years, finally, uh, through whatever the causes have been in history, and most of them have been because of oppression, the Negro people have uh, strongly and fully taken the bit in their teeth. They're asking absolutely no quarter from anyone. Even the, the hand that is extended in terms of, 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 of uh, 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 brotherhood and, and friendship, to the white citizens who want to participate, it is for them to make the choice to accept because they intend to move without it. And that, uh, uh, and I don't mean to say that the black community is not a community that does not have responsibility in this current revolution, but I do say that the bulk of the interpretation of whether this thing is going to end successfully and joyously or is going to end disastrously lays very heavily with the white community it lays very heavily with the profiteers. It lays very heavily with the vested interests. It lays very heavily with a great middle stream in this country of people who have refused to commit themselves or even have the slightest knowledge that these things have been going on. And those who have decried demonstrations and who have said the Negro is going too far, they are the ones who in fact are being provoked the most by this because for the first time, and it is only through our demonstrations, that they have come to a level of consciousness. And in this now that we speak of, it is this point of no return, because we are on the march, and there is going to be no return from it, because the march in Washington today is one thing, but it doesn't end there. There are going to be marches again, and there are going to be marches in the local villages and in the local cities, and, in the, and, and uh, it's not just in the South, it's in the North, it's all over. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, we heard Mr. Belafonte talking about point of no return. I've seen every head here nodding when he said that. He also mentioned responsibility, and I think that everybody uh, has uh, demonstrated that in Washington today. But Dr. King, who has uh, fought in the name of nonviolence, love, and brotherhood, also talks about a dream he has. We heard this eloquent statement of the, the great dream that even in, in Alabama uh, we're going to accomplish this. Um, you're not a prophet. You're a novelist, but novelists very often see into the future. Do you share the dream? Do you, do you think it will be achieved? I think we all at this table, and many more people than that, share that dream. When Martin said that he, he dreamed of a country in which his four children would not be penalized because of their color, all of us, all of us believe that. I think we're all committed to that. To one, it is perhaps paradoxical, but as the American Negro in this context, who on the basis of the evidence, has more, has the most faith in this country. I myself have always, no matter how bitter I became, believed, as Harry puts it, in the potential of this country, in the tremendous energy here, and the things that we can achieve, if we will. The importance of today, in my mind, is that for the first time in our history, and the first time in 100 years, the nation shows some signs of really dealing with its central problem, instead of as it has done for 100 years, avoiding it, evading it, denying it, lying about it, pretending it did not exist. The country will have to now go to work, and very hard work, very dangerous work, to change itself, to achieve this dream that Martin was talking about. And if we do not achieve this dream, we have no future at all. Do you believe we will achieve it? I certainly believe it. I certainly In believe it. In a non-violent manner? But it, yes, I believe that too, but it is going to cost us 
every single one of us, including everyone, everyone here and everyone in this country. I'm not quite so prepared to say that it will not be achieved without violence. Uh, because uh, uh, the Negro people have conducted themselves nonviolently. Uh, the 200,000 people that were there today, there were many predictions and one could take book uh, on whether there would be a display of violence by all the extreme factions and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is that the people who came to that gathering today were people in great anguish who have come from the Birminghams and come from the Jackson, Mississippis. And they came there with anguish and with hurt and with dignity and with integrity and it was one of the most orderly displays I've ever seen of 200,000 people with agreements. I never seen anything like it. And uh, uh, if the Bull Connors continue to release dogs on the people as an answer to their legitimate cries, if they continue to use cattle rods to prod them, if they continue to use hoses to whip them through the streets, the human heart and the human body can only contain so much. There must come a point, if they are pushed to it, for retaliation. So once again, I put the emphasis on who it is that will precipitate it. Because I do believe that the Negro community, most, I, I think that I can speak for, for, for most of the 20 million Negroes are committed to this thing being done nonviolently. They have already displayed that. They've displayed it very eloquently since the Montgomery oh, yes. bus strikes. Oh, yes. And I also must say one other thing, because I know we must move on and others must speak. But uh, when you speak of Peking and you speak of Moscow and you speak of other centers in the world where a demonstration like today could not take place, yes, I accept that. But I also say that it is long since past the time when we can measure our own conscience and our own sense of morality based on what some decayed society refuses to give its own. We must, it is like arguing with the present administration as to what we feel they did or did not do in relation to the civil rights struggle because they were measuring it based on the previous Mr. Belafonte, I could not agree with you more in terms of measuring in our society, but remember, the entire world watches this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't have a correct measuring stick. We all have lived around the world. When I mention Moscow, Peking, or any of these things, it is because here we are talking to the world. More than 100 countries will be listening to yeah. the discussion yeah, today. No, no, I understand that. I just want to make one statement to tie this off. I agree with you wholeheartedly, incidentally. And I said that yes. in the beginning. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we are also the loudest crier of that's any nation in the that's world exactly point. about democracy and about the free see, countries. What we've what been we doing, in effect, do. is we've been letting the Negro have his dream. Say, go on dreaming. Well, the time has come, I think, and we've shown, we've shown today, to stop dreaming this dream and wake up to it. Mm -hmm. Because this dream was put into very precise words called the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. It was restated as the Emancipation Proclamation. And in this past hundred years, the ne we have permitted the Negro to have his dream. A dream that was restated by Dr. King today. But Dr. King injected one new point, which is that perhaps perhaps an aroused American people can permit the rest of the American people to... And I firmly believe that. This is the point. Mr. Poitier came to this country. How old were you when you came to America? Fourteen. You were fourteen years old when mm -hmm. you came to this country. Uh, what has been the evolution of your own thinking as you, as you met this problem and as you face it today? And what do you as a person, not as an actor or even perhaps not even as a Negro, but how do you feel inside of yourself you, you, you're forced to participate. Well, yeah, well yes, uh, I am forced to participate because it is my conviction that uh, my country has to successfully negotiate the Negro question. It is to me not a problem. It's the question of the Negro, the unsettled question of the Negro in America. We must, as a country, successfully negotiate that before we can, uh, <coughs> with any degree of honesty, try to uh, become uh, eligible for uh, participation in the future. We must negotiate other great questions that face us today. And <coughs> the stamina, the texture of our uh, endeavor to solve the Negro question will uh, <coughs> will exemplify for me uh, the kind of interest the country as a whole has in doing the things that are necessary for us to be entitled to a future.
Mr. Heston, you want to say something? Well, uh, everything that we've been saying in the last few minutes illustrates vividly the the vital importance of this question, not only for Negro Americans, but for all Americans, and thus, in view of our position in the world, for all the world. And again, the importance of it and the difficulty, uh, as both Harry and, and Jimmy Baldwin suggested, that, that it's not an easy, a downhill coast. The, the difficulty of the times ahead uh, cannot be overemphasized. Again, I can't help thinking that it was never more eloquently put than uh, uh, Tom Paine put it, writing in the winter of Valley Forge, and another difficult time for this country, when he said, uh, these are the times that try men's souls, the sunshine patriot and the summer soldier will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country, but he that stands it now will earn the love and thanks of man and woman. That's why I think, uh, for, a big, for a starter, why don't we sometimes refer to it as the white question? It's an American question. It's an American no, American I question. think it is the white question, and I think that's one of the things that's come, that has brought people... I don't people. think so. It's oh, just a it human is. question. <laughs> yes, because but in the ebb and flow of human events, these things come and go. Conflicts of this kind come and go. There is a renaissance of democratic spirit. The Negroes are giving us a lesson now that we have been... Uh, that we've been waiting for. We've yeah. gone a little stale, gotten a little fat. I think they've made us aware and of the white question, yes. and we've got to answer it. Yes, we've but if you examine, for instance, uh, 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 well, I think you're both right, really. I mean, yes. It's a white yes. question, question. and a woman. This, this thing can no longer ebb and flow. This thing has got to be a There's always an ebb and flow in history. One country is up, one country no, is down. One it's been cozy to think of it, Marlon, as the Negro question. It was the Negro dream. I don't disagree with that. You know, uh... I, I, think I think that the, the, the valid, responsibility has shifted. It, it, it is a, I don't think it's just a question of semantics. I think the responsibility has shifted to the white people of America. Sure. Well, I think we may all agree, we seem to be in agreement, um, that it's not a question of semantics, but that words often get in the way of what we mean to say. Um, Mr. <coughs> Poitier corrected himself when he said Negro problem, and then he changed it to Negro question. He was weighing his words very carefully. Well, I think, <coughs> I think implied in Negro problem uh, is a kind of uh, suggestion that I represent a problem. Sure, I do exactly. not represent a problem, Precisely. you follow. The Negroes are and not I a think problem if to I us. We're a problem to the Negroes. <laughs> we're all this saying the, the same thing. No, we're not. It's not the same thing at all. And this is, the, this is what I, I have become aware of. It no, is. no, Joe is very correct because, I don't think it is because, the because, because, I because the person who holds in his hand the power to fulfill the American dream, to fulfill the words of Tom Paine, to fulfill the words of the Declaration of Independence, happens to be a person who is white. Right. And he yes, sits to imply that it's a, uh, a solely a white problem is to is to deny the burning interest of every every fellow Negro citizen. It is. It is. It's Negro really it's it's Negro it is, it is however, it's gentlemen. Uh, I think yeah, we're. That's uh, fair enough. I'll give you that. The crosstalk yeah. is such that. Uh, what you're saying, which I think everybody wants to hear, is being lost, all of your words of wisdom. But maybe we can end it on this point. How would you phrase yourself, very briefly now, as, as succinctly as you can put the uh, essence of your thought, what is the nature of this question today? Uh, what is the most important thing to be done by each and every one of us? If you had the right to say, I, James Baldwin, will tell people what to do and how to solve this thing. What would you say? My God. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> in three words? <laughs> Not in three no. words. No, a single thing. For example, I happen to think, just to give you an idea of what I'm getting at, that the most important thing at the moment now is, uh, is jobs. That's quite true. But the, the, but the nature of the problem, as I see it, is, is so complex that one can't simply say jobs. One has to say jobs, schools, houses. It's a whole complex of mm -hmm. things, you know. Jobs, won't, jobs alone won't solve it, schools alone won't solve it. It's, a, it's in the social fabric, you know. It isn't it, anything, it's everything. It's everything. Mm -hmm. And I really think, to come back to Joe's point in another way, and at the risk of sounding mystical, that the first step probably has to be somewhere in the American conscience. I think the American, the American white republic has to ask itself why it was necessary for them to invent the nigger. You know, I am not a nigger. You know, I never called myself one. But you, one comes into the world, and the world, put, the world decides that the, you are this for its own reasons. And it is very important, I think, for the American, in terms of, in terms of the future, in terms of, the, the, of his health, in terms of the transformation we are all seeking, 
that he faced this question, that he needed the nigger for something. You know, may I please be forgiven for interrupting. In fact, <clears throat> we have run out of time, but it's kind of a good point because what you've ended up with is to say we've all got to face the question. I think what we've done today... You have just witnessed an unrehearsed discussion by those whose deeply held personal views have committed them to the cause of civil rights. The moderator has been David Schoenbrunn. In the summer of 1963, a pivotal moment in the fight for civil rights unfolded as thousands gathered in Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. This historic event was not just a gathering of the masses, but a profound statement against systemic racism and economic inequality. Within this context, the film Hollywood Roundtable featured influential figures such as Harry Belafonte, Marlon Brando, Charlton Heston, Sidney Poitier, Joseph Mankiewicz, James Baldwin, and David Shunbrun. Their discussion on the march illuminated the intersection of art, activism, and the urgent call for justice. The march itself was a culmination of years of struggle, echoing the cries of those who had long been denied basic human rights. As the nation grappled with the injustices of segregation and discrimination, the voices of prominent Black figures in Hollywood provided us a powerful platform to amplify the message of the march. Belafonte, a passionate activist, utilized his celebrity status to raise awareness about civil rights issues, understanding that the fight for justice extended beyond the stage and screen. His commitment to the movement was unwavering, recognizing the potential of art to inspire change. Marlon Brando and Charlton Heston engaged in the conversation with an understanding of the cultural significance of the civil rights movement. Their insights highlighted the role that influential individuals can play in addressing societal issues, emphasizing the necessity of empathy and action among all people. Brando, known for his outspoken views against racial injustice, spoke candidly about the importance of confronting these issues head on. Sidney Poitier, the first black actor to win an Academy Award for Best Actor, represented the aspirations and challenges of his time. His presence at the roundtable was as a voice for the voiceless. Poitier's own experiences with racism fueled his commitment to civil rights, and he understood that representation in film and media was crucial for changing perceptions and dismantling stereotypes. James Baldwin, a towering intellectual and writer, brought depth to the conversation. He articulated the complexities of race in America, emphasizing that the fight for civil rights was deeply intertwined with the broader struggle for humanity. Baldwin spoke eloquently about the pain and resilience of Black Americans, urging everyone to confront the uncomfortable truths of racism. His insights reminded participants that the march was not merely a political act, but a declaration of dignity. Joseph Mankiewicz, as a filmmaker, recognized the significance of storytelling in shaping societal narratives. He understood that film had the power to influence public opinion and bring the realities of racism to light. The roundtable served as a testament to the responsibility of artists to engage with the issues of their time and use their craft to foster understanding. Moderated by David Schoenbrunn, the discussion provided a critical examination of the march's significance. Participants reflected on the need for systemic change and the role of the federal government in addressing racial inequality. Their dialogue encompassed not just the march itself, but the ongoing struggle that lay ahead. They acknowledged that the march was a beginning, emphasizing the necessity of sustained activism to achieve true equality. The Hollywood Roundtable captured a moment when the worlds of entertainment and activism converged. It showcased how those in positions of influence could galvanize support for the civil rights movement encouraging others to join the fight. The discussions that took place in that room reverberated beyond the screen, inspiring countless individuals to become engaged in the struggle for justice. As we reflect on the importance of this gathering, it becomes evident that the fight for civil rights is ongoing. The voices of those who spoke in 1963 continue to resonate today, urging us to confront the injustices that persist in our society. The call for unity, understanding and action 
remains as vital now as it was then. In the spirit of the March and the Roundtable, we are reminded that the struggle is interconnected. The fight against racism, economic disparity, and social injustice requires collective efforts from all who believe in equality. Honoring the legacy of those who marched and those who used their platforms to advocate for change serves as an inspiration to continue the fight for a world where justice is not just a dream, but a reality for all.